All right, as we continue through our journey through the Sermon of the Mount, we find ourselves at a fork in the road, the actual few verses that talk about choosing a gate to walk through. I don't know how many times I've heard these few verses referenced in sermons and classes and conversations and books, but it's been a lot, like quite a few. The narrow road and the wide road. One leads to life, the other one leads to destruction. One is hard, one is easy. I want us to read the text together this morning, right here at the start. We're in Matthew 7, starting in verse 13, if you want to follow along on the screen or in your Bibles. The NIV says this, Enter through the narrow gate. For wide is the gate, and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. But small is the gate, and narrow the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. Now I want us to also read it from the message, because I think it's really easy to get get, get caught up in the language of gates and roads, and it's often hard to see past the metaphor that Jesus is using here. And I think the message message does a really good job of putting this in some different words for us. It says, don't look for shortcuts to God. The market is flooded with surefire, easygoing formulas for a successful life that can be practiced in your spare time. Don't fall for that stuff, even though crowds of people do. The way to life to God is vigorous and requires total attention. Enter through the narrow gate. Don't look for shortcuts. Small is the gate and narrow is the road that leads to life. The way to life, to God, is vigorous and requires total attention. I really like reading these two versions together, kind of in tandem with one another. It helps me wrap my head a little bit more around what Jesus is saying in these few verses. Now, like so much of the Sermon on the Mount, there is a lot to unpack in just a few words. We're not given a lot here in these two verses. I'm not really a fan of picking apart verses completely. I think it kind of sucks the life out of Scripture at times. I remember having to get really, really detailed and in the weeds when I was learning Hebrew and I was translating some of the Psalms. And we picked apart every word, every phrase, every connection, and it was really daunting. But the job of translators, like when you translate scripture, and interpreters, like we do when we read scripture, are different. And I think that's really important, especially with passages that are often used to direct behavior or attitudes. I think it's really good for us to do our best to understand what Jesus was saying and how his original original audience also might have understood it. Now, here we are with a passage that talks about gates and roads. Unlike some other parts of scripture, there are things, these are actually things that we see and interact with every single day, probably, for most of us. Now, I'm not a shepherd, so anytime scripture talks about shepherds or sheep, I have to do a lot more work to actually figure out what that passage is saying. I have used a gate before. I have walked down a path. I drive on roads every single day. As people living in Colorado, we are all too familiar with trails and paths, and as human beings, we're familiar with roads. So this is something that we should all be, it it should be rather easy for us to figure out what Jesus is trying to say here. Now, at many trailheads, there are people who start out by going through those, like, two wooden posts. Some trails have, like, posts that mark the entrance. And if you were to look, like, pause before you kept going and look on either side of that regular entrance, you would see worn down paths on both the left and the right side of that trailhead. People have gone around. They've forged their own path. People try to find an easier way to go through or to start. They try to find a faster, sometimes a cleaner way. Sometimes that main path is really muddy or wet. The narrow way um, is the thing that you start out with, but there's also something else. There's another choice for us to take. The wide road is often described as easy. It is translated in a few different places, like the English Standard Version, the New Living Version, and the Revised Standard Version. Those are a couple. It's translated as wide and easy. But the majority of translations that we use don't actually use the word easy. 
interpreters, pastors, theologians, they have used this word very generously, I think, because it makes that wider road sound more appealing. We want to take an easier road. We don't always want to choose something that's really, really difficult. The broad and easy road makes it sound like it's almost taunting us, making the narrow and difficult road look terrifying and treacherous and dangerous. In reality, what is often translated as easy is actually just another word for broad or spacious. It's reinforcing this idea that the road is very wide. We know that the narrow road is difficult. Jesus makes that very clear. But I think the wide road might be difficult too. Life in general is difficult. If you've ever gone on a hike, you know this all too well. Sometimes really well-marked trails are difficult and strenuous. Just because something has a clear sign to it doesn't make it easy. The, ride, the road is wide, but that doesn't automatically make it easy. It just means that it's easier to get to. The gate is well-marked, and there are a lot of other people entering on it at the same time. Now, regardless of what we find on the path before us, the first step is actually to walk through a gate. We have to intentionally choose which way to go. Zach and I got to spend our honeymoon wandering around Scotland this past March. And if you've never had a chance to go, it is so beautiful. It is lush and green. There are these rolling hills and like super dramatic cliffs. And you drive around and everywhere you look, there are things that are older than the United States, like all over the place. Not North America, but the United States. I had to make that distinction a whole bunch when I was there. Our history here in the U.S. is just a tiny drop in the bucket compared to the history of Scotland, and I really geek out on that kind of stuff. Well, in the middle of our trip, we stayed in a town called Bolitor, which is about 15 minutes from Balmoral Castle. And if you're a fan of The Crown or you know anything about the late Queen Elizabeth, this was one of her favorite places to stay. Well, Zach and I decided to go hiking one of the days that we were there, and there was this trail that you could follow that takes you, like, all around the Balmoral property, and you get to see all of these different carns or monuments that have been built in honor of uh, Queen Victoria's children. She was the original owner of Balmoral Castle. Now, we made it all the way to the top. It wasn't a super strenuous hike, but it was kind of vertical. And we weren't super tired. We still had some water left. And so instead of just backtracking and going back down, we decided to keep going. This trail that we were following was kind of this big loop, and we were supposed to be able to see like eight or nine different monuments. Well, because it wasn't super well marked, and because we we hadn't really looked at a map before we went on this journey, um, we ended up really confused and not sure where we were. And eventually, we followed this road that had a couple of signs on it that we deciphered as like, sure, we're going on the right path. But we found ourselves at this like four-way path, five ways if you include the path that we were on walking towards it. And to our left was like this old rickety gate. Uh, Right in front of us was a path that went up and then split off in two. And then to our right, there was just another road. Like, we could have just kept going on this road. Um, I was, was like, fully convinced that if we were to go through the gate, we were going to be trespassing on royal property. Like, I thought we were going to get arrested. Zach had to calm me down a little bit. But as I was looking at this map on my phone, I didn't have great service. It was like really stressful. I was sweating a lot. Um, we realized that the right way to go to see all of these different monuments was through the gate. Like we had to go that way. And eventually, like Zach talked me down. He was far less concerned that we were going to trespass and be arrested. It's like not a great idea to visit Scottish castles and see dungeons and then like trespass on royal property. I was like fully convinced that we were going to be thrown in jail. I was, yeah, it was, it was not great. Well, yeah, eventually this like other group came through the gate and they might have been royal descendants. I don't know. Maybe it was their land, but we like decided to go through the gate, and I was really stressed out about it the whole rest of our journey. It was, yeah, clearly I, like, still have some serious anxiety about this. Um, The bummer of the story is we didn't eventually see any of these other monuments because we didn't make another correct turn. Like, the path was not well marked. We missed another turn, um, but we did eventually trespass on the actual castle lawn. Like, (laughs) it was closed down, and we weren't supposed to be there, and... Yeah, I'm still really anxious about it. 
well, all of, all of that being said, like the long story short is this. We like didn't accidentally go through the gate. We had to make a conscious decision. We had to actually decide if we were going to go through it. We had to kind of like shimmy through it. We weren't walking along only to realize that we had passed a gate and it was way behind us. Even if that gate had been wide open and easier to go through, we still had to make the decision to step across the threshold and enter into this new space, onto this new road. We had to make a choice. I kind of love that Jesus doesn't demand that we take the narrow road. He strongly suggests it, to be sure, but we are offered a choice. The narrow road, or we could choose the wide road. Often we read through these verses, and we really fixate on that broad path, this wide road leading to destruction. One leads to life, one leads to destruction. And we make it a place to talk about the really fiery and terrible landscape of hell and the consequence of sin. In his commentary, Scott McKnight says that this actually is not the place to debate the, na- the nature of hell. But instead, it's the place to observe that our one life now determines whether our end will be life. I'm not trying to let us off the hook when it comes to hell or the realities of sin, but instead I'm trying to attempt to reframe these few verses for us. There are other places in scripture where we can glean more about hell and the end times and all of those things. In a few weeks, we'll actually be in a whole series on Revelation where we might touch on that. We haven't really decided, but we might talk about it. I'm just not sure that these verses here in Matthew 7 should be added to that bunch. Could Jesus mean the destruction of hell with this word destruction? I think he could. The word means literally a destruction of person or property, but it also means a more eternal sense. I think Jesus could also mean that walking down the wide road will impact who we are as human beings in the here and now. I think Jesus could be talking both about what will happen to us in the life to come and the choices that we make today, how those impact us each and every day. The gates we choose to walk through here and now have an impact on who we are and where we are going. For a long time, I read this verse and would get really worried about which road I was on. I would hope and pray that I had chosen the right one as if this was a one-time decision that I had to make at some point, I don't even know when this decision was made, and then I had to live with it the rest of my life. But what if we thought about this choice, these gates to go through, as more of a discipleship model, a choice that we get to make each and every day? So much of the Sermon on the Mount is about discipleship, about following the way of Jesus. Why should these two verses be any different? Anna Veersbicka, a professor at Australian National University, says this about this part of the Sermon on the Mount. She says, most people take, at least part of the time, the wide and smooth road that leads to destruction. Very few choose consistently the narrow way. But this does not mean that Jesus was predicting destruction as the final outcome of most people's lives. To interpret the gate and road sayings in this way is to misunderstand their genre. They are exhortations, not predictions. An exhortation is a strong encouragement. Jesus is strongly encouraging us to take the narrow gate, to follow his direction and ways. From everything I know about Jesus, from everything I know about God, we are not presented with this one option, one time and one time only. God offers us continual love and grace. God's desire for us is to take the narrow way, but we are not forsaken if we make the wrong turn, if we choose the wrong gate. God's hand of grace is always extended to us. Like I mentioned before, I I used to really worry about whether or not I would know if I had chosen the right path, if I had walked through the right gate. How would I know if I went the right way? What if I thought I was on the narrow path and I was actually on the wide one? The evangelical, like, fear and guilt ran so deep within me. It still does at some times. But here's the really cool thing. Jesus actually tells us where to find the gate in other places in Scripture. We're not left to figure it out on our own. In John 10, 9, Jesus himself tells us that I am the gate and whoever enters through me will be saved. 
Following the way of Jesus is taking the narrow path. The two go hand in hand. If you are chasing after the Lord, if you are loving your neighbor, if you are treating other people the way that Jesus would treat them, you are following the way of Jesus. Are you doing it imperfectly sometimes? Totally. But you are following the way of Jesus. You are on the narrow path that we see in Matthew 7, verse 12, when Jesus says, do to others whatever you would do that whatever you would like them to do to you, this is the essence of all that is taught in the law and the prophets. As Becca mentioned last week, the whole of what Jesus is teaching during the Sermon on the Mount kind of boils down to this thought. Do your best to love other people and treat them well. That is the narrow path. Everything we have read and talked about up to this point in the Sermon on the Mount is leading us to the narrow gate, To enter the narrow gate is to live as best we can by all of these things. Jesus is our example to follow, our guide to and while we're on the narrow path. In his book, Discipleship, Dietrich Bonhoeffer talks a lot about this idea of paths and gates. And at one point he says, as long as I recognize this road as the one I am commanded to walk and try to walk it in fear of myself, it is truly impossible. But if I see Jesus Christ walking ahead of me, step by step, if I look only at him and follow him, step by step, then I will be protected on this path. The narrow gate demands discipleship. And if this is a journey of discipleship, I wonder then if our decision to choose a gate is a daily one, one we have to revisit every morning, Which gate am I going to choose today? Will I choose the path of discipleship or will I choose the path that is less strict, less stringent? Again, I'm not trying to let us off the hook anywhere, but I really don't think that we are only faced with this choice one time and then have to deal with the consequences for the rest of our lives. I'll quote Scott McKnight again. He says, the intent of Jesus in in these words is a rhetoric of clarity He wants his listeners to see that life matters, that their moral life matters both now and for the age to come, and he wants them to decide to follow him. Jesus is not trying to trick us here. We see very clearly the desire of God's heart in these verses, and that is for us to follow the way of Jesus, to live lives of discipleship, even though it may not be the easiest decision for us to always make. Discipleship is a daily decision. Choosing Jesus is a daily decision. We walk through a gate every day, whether we realize it or not. It's kind of like choosing to love another person, a family member, a spouse, a good friend. Love is a choice, one that we have to step into all the time. Discipleship, choosing to live in the way of Jesus, is exactly the same. Now, I don't want this to be a scary thing for any of us, thinking that every morning we will wake up and have to choose a gate to walk through. We make all kinds of little and big decisions throughout our days. Over the last three months, I've been kind of feeling decision fatigue, being the only one here with Nathan not around, making all these decisions. Instead of challenging us all this week to take captive every decision we make, I want to challenge us to something a little bit more attainable, a little less scary. Discipleship is a lifelong journey. Becoming more and more like Jesus is something we will work on for the rest of our lives, every single one of us. And expecting us to figure it out in a day or a week would be very cruel. (laughs) So this week, I want us to ask a question of ourselves. Maybe it's every day, maybe it's every once in a while, maybe you ask it of yourself once. I want us to simply ask, how could I be more like Jesus today? Ask yourself that this week and see if there is something you can do each day or a couple times this week that could make your life more like Jesus's. Could you pray for someone when they pop into your mind? Could you mow your neighbor's lawn when you're out there doing your own? Could you send a text to a friend letting them know that you're thinking about them? Maybe you buy coffee for someone who's in line behind you. If we take less time stressing over which gate we are walking through and which path we are on, and we spend more time trying to love the people around us, trying to follow the way of Jesus, I think we will find that we are on the narrow path more often than we think. 
Will we choose the wrong gate from time to time? We totally will. We are human beings and we are imperfect. But God's hand is always there offering grace and love and guiding us back and encouraging us to come back to that narrow way. Let's pray. God, we're thankful that you put a path before us, even if we get to choose which one we go on. Lord, we pray that this week you would show us different ways to be more like you, to really step into the way of living life like you did. God, we know that we're imperfect. We know we will fail from time to time. But we are so grateful for your grace and love for us that you are always there to bring us back, to redirect us, to show us your love once again, over and over and over. Lord, we love you. We pray that this week as we dive into what it looks like to following the way of Jesus and just being on your path, that you would truly be our guide, that we would keep our eyes on you and follow you step by step. We love you, Lord. We pray all these things in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.